All right, good day, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Aquarium Live. My name is Luke. Good to see you all again. I haven't been here for, for a week or two, so it's nice to be back in the uh, studio. And today, we have a really interesting program this afternoon. Pardon me while I mess with my mic here. We have an interesting program this afternoon. We're gonna, it's called Ask a Scientist Octopus. And we're not asking a, a scientist octopus, though octopuses are very smart, so an octopus scientist, you know, doesn't seem that unreasonable to me. But instead, we're going to be talking about scientists. And also, some of you may be tuning in trying to uh, check out another program we did earlier. It was about sharks. There was, an, there was a labeling error on our website, so unfortunately, it sounds like both classes are taking place right now. So if you're here for sharks, don't worry. I'll throw some shark stuff in. If you have any shark questions, you can send them my way, and I'll be happy to talk about those too. But we're going to mostly be focusing on octopuses because that is the main program we had in mind for this afternoon. So first off, though, before we even get to this octopus part, oh, and I should say, if you have questions, you can text them to us live at 562-286-1838 or email us at live at lbaop.org. Live questions, go to the text. And if you have questions later, if you're watching this and it's not live, you can use the email. And I am helped today here in the studio by Carrie, who's answering, who's taking questions and also passing them on to me to answer live on the show. And by Stacy, who is behind the camera operating all the cool image, images and stuff that we're going to be bringing up. So we have got three people here to answer your questions, and we'll be taking a lot of those questions and sharing them right here on the, on the air, on the wire, online. So, asking a scientist. Now, I have to tell you, when I went to teach this class, I felt at first like, hmm, am I a scientist? Can I, ask, can I tell people to ask me as a scientist? Is that something I, it's fair for me to say? And the reason this troubled me is because I have to tell you in honesty, my job here is more, more about teaching people how to talk to people and also if you've seen any of our puppet stuff, like the Daily Bubble, like I, I do that, for example. But I've also worked here at the aquarium for 15 years. And while normally when we talk about what makes this person a scientist, we think that you know, and it's a real technical thing that you have to work in a laboratory, you have to do research in the field. But science isn't just for the people who make the discoveries, it's also for those of us who communicate it and share it and teach it. And it's for anybody who wants to learn to think like a scientist, because the way scientists think and see the world is useful in any part of our lives. So when it comes to being a scientist, you don't have to feel like you can't say, oh, I'm, a, I'm not a scientist because I'm not a doctor or I don't have a degree. If you spend a lot of time learning about scientists and thinking like a scientist, and especially if you're luck, like me and lucky enough to get, to get to spend a lot of time with people who do actually have some of those degrees and actually do have things like laboratory experience that Stacy has behind the camera and stuff like that, you can become a scientist on your own. You can be a scientist as long as you think, as you're thinking about the world in a scientific way. Now, so we're going to see if I am a good candidate for a scientist you can ask about octopuses over the course of this program. I invite you guys to ask, ask, ask any questions you want, any questions at all. We can, you can send those in again via the text number. We'll be putting that up on the screen throughout the program. Again, it's 562-286-1838. And anytime you got questions, we're ready to take them. Now, let's begin though, by just looking at an octopus. I'm gonna step off screen so we can look at an octopus doing some things for a few moments. I wanna see if this generates any ideas. What do we, what do we uh, see when you look at the octopus? Just take a moment and check it out. So here we have one of our giant Pacific octopuses. Now this is kind of a fun video. This is back when our GPO was a little bit smaller. That's what we call them here at the aquarium for short, the GPO. And look at how this animal moves. Now, the first thing that you probably realize when you look at an octopus is that it is, well, it's a weird animal, isn't it? I mean, when we first learn about animals when we're kids, you know, we think about things like dogs and cats and birds and lizards and stuff like that. And all those animals have a lot of things in common. I mean, I mean a bird and a lizard are pretty different, right? But they've all got four limbs. They've all got spinal column. They've got bones inside their bodies, right? A lot of the animals that we normally kind of talk about are vertebrates, are animals with backbones, such as ourselves, right? But the crazy thing about an octopus is, of course, that, well, there's a lot of crazy things about an octopus, which we'll get to, <laughs> but the crazy thing about an octopus, right, is this is like the most soft bodied creature you could, like, possibly imagine. This thing just move around and squeeze and through things, whatever way it wants, it has no bones in its body at all. All the movements you see an octopus doing 
are happening just using soft body parts, just soft tissues like muscles and skin and things like that that don't, that don't really have any hardness to them. The only really hard parts of an octopus's entire body are its beak and the lenses of its eyes, and that's about it. The rest of the octopus is entirely soft, which is one of the most amazing adaptations. And this softness is just one of their many interesting features. But also, when I talk about octopuses too, the next thing that comes up for me though is that there are other animals that seem to have a lot in common with octopuses, right? And this is because octopuses are part of a family of animals that all share certain common features. So for one thing, the big, big family that octopuses belong to are called the mollusks. And that big giant group is really diverse and includes everything from snails to clams to octopuses, so on. But then if you get that a little smaller and get a little more specific inside that big family of animals, there's a smaller group in there called the cephalopods. And those are octopuses and several other animals that are very similar to them in a lot of ways. Can anyone think of an animal that's similar to an octopus in some ways? An animal that seems like it might belong in the same family? Let's see here. I wonder if we can bring some up. Ooh, what about this one? What is this thing? This is a cuttlefish. Now, I love cuttlefish because they're kind of like, you might have guessed the other member of this family right now is squid. Has anyone thought of that one? Squid right are another member of the family. This is a probably a humble squid here in this picture. It's a really big squid. Not as big as the giant squid, but it's really big. And squid and octopus and, and cuttlefish are all part of the same family, the cephalopods. And I love the cuttlefish because it kind of looks like the back half is a squid and the front half is an octopus. They're really kind of a weird blend, right? But all the animals in this family have certain shared characteristics. For one thing, they all have almost totally soft bodies. The, set, the cuttlefish is a little bit of an exception because it's got this thing inside called a cuddle bone, though the rest of it is soft. And it's not really a bone, it's kind of just a hard white thing, kind of shaped like a, I guess shaped like a, kind of like an oval. And the, another characteristic they all have in common, if we look at the different members of this family, probably the first thing we notice, right, is that they've all got arms or tentacles with suction cups on them. This is a major identifying feature. There's other animals in the world that use suction in various ways to hold on to things and stuff, and some other animals have come up with ways to create their own kind of suction cups. But the ones that you see on the cephalopods are really, really special. They're so well controlled. Let's see if we can watch a video of one of our octopuses moving around. So this is our giant Pacific octopus moving around on the window of its exhibit. Sorry for that glare in the shot there. And my bad photography. But anyway, it's going to get better. You just wait and see. <laughs> Now, look at this. Look at the way that these suction cups can so delicately come off and reattach. And there's hundreds of these things. Each one of these individual suction cups is controlled by the octopus, right? And this octopus is able to do all sorts of stuff with them constantly, all the time. And can, can grab onto things with them, can feel things with them, can taste things with them. And this feature is, I think, most amazing when you watch how an octopus can use them. I keep on wanting to get out of the way. Oh, this is cool. Up close view of the suction cups in action. See how they bend and twist and reshape themselves to grab onto different stuff or to get out of the way of other ones that are trying to come in? The octopus uses ex suction cups probably in more ways than any of the other cephalopods do because octopuses are always exploring their environment. You know, squid mostly just swim around, right? The giant squid doesn't even swim a lot of the time. A lot of the time it just kind of floats. And the cuttlefish mainly use their, suction, their tentacles and, their, and, their, and the suction cups in their arms to grab onto food and things like that, which of course is what the octopus does too. But the thing I love watching an octopus is that they're, they're major explorers. They're very constantly curi curious about their environment, always exploring everything around them. And this isn't really surprising once you find out that the octopus has a really sophisticated brain compared to not just any other mollusk or any other cephalopod, but compared to any other invertebrate. Octopuses are often considered the smartest of all the invertebrates for a bunch of different reasons. And first among these is the fact that they're pretty good explorers. This is like I said earlier, if there was going to be an animal scientist, an octopus would be a pretty good candidate. Because octopuses naturally are curious and are always looking for new hiding places. And when they find new objects, they come up with creative uses for them. You can spend hours on YouTube looking for videos of octopuses that have found things like coconuts and bottles and things and learned how to hide inside them or carry them around. When octopuses find new objects, they come up sometimes with creative new uses for them. Octopuses are also builders. They build their own nests oftentimes when they're, when they're protecting their eggs. The giant Pacific octopus, the mom will grab a bunch of rocks and stack them up in front of her. 
and make sure she has a nice safe hole to live in. And that exploration is just one of the many things an octopus's brain is taking care of all the time. But there's another amazing adaptation that octopuses have too, and that's their skin. Octopus skin, like the skin of most other cephalopods, can do a lot of amazing things. And octopuses, I think, are the ones who are best at these things, probably, of all the cephalopods. For one thing, in some of the other videos, this is still the giant Pacific octopus. In some of the other videos, didn't its skin look smoother? But now look at it. It's all wrinkly and spiky. One thing octopuses can do with their skin is change its texture. All over their skin, they have these different, they have these basically kind of ring-shaped muscles that interlock in this sort of web-like pattern that allow them, when they, when they pinch those muscles closed, to basically create these spike shapes on their skin. And they can do this on all of their body, on parts of their body. They can do it just a little bit. They can do it a whole bunch. And now you can see she's already smooth, or this is he, actually, already smoothing out here. But then some of those spikes are still there. And this is one of the reasons why, if you don't know, if you don't know your octopuses really well, it can sometimes be even hard to tell what kind of an octopus you're looking at at first glance, because they can change the shape of their body. They can change the texture of their skin. And to make it even harder, they can also change their color. You probably have heard about this before if you've spent time learning about octopuses. Octopuses have the ability to change the color and even the pattern of color on their skin to blend in with practically anything they want to, especially the kinds of stuff that you find in the habitats where they live. So we can actually show some examples of this from an octopus that was taken in the natural habitat. Watch this. Okay, now this octopus, here it is. It's kind of a reddish brown octopus, right? All right, wants to hunker down here on this piece of coral or reef there. And whoa, what does it look like now? Now you might say, well, I can still see that it's an octopus, but that's because it's still excited. What if it settles down and stays there in that position? All that, those, that kind of weird pattern on its body is just going to look like maybe some algae growing on a rock or maybe some coral. If it sits totally still, most animals will not see it when they pass by. And octopuses, can, octopuses do this for two different reasons. One, they don't want to be seen by predators, of course. But most importantly, octopuses are incredible predators themselves. And most of the time, the way that they do this, the way that they catch their prey is not by chasing it around because they're not super fast moving and they're not really good at going on a straight line when they're moving really fast either. But rather by just waiting for something to get close enough to wherever they're hiding, sometimes in plain sight because they're so well camouflaged they don't even need to hide underneath anything, and then just reach out and grab it, wrap their body around it, pull it in, and eat. And although we don't have any video of an octopus hunting, we do, I believe, have a video of a, of a little bit of how an octopus eats. This will be another video of our giant Pacific octopus which we can watch here. And it also shows a little bit about how octopuses aren't deterred by new or weird things that come into their environment, and rather they can find new ways to explore them. So in this video, which this is always cool to watch. I can watch this all day. Ooh, we got some questions. Gage asked, how does an octopus eat? Gage, I'm glad you asked. Nice to talk to you again, Gage. Because we're just about to look at that. Um, and while Stacy's finding that video, it should be on the, it should be on the Mac. We, we have it. Oh, we have it. All right, Stacy's going to bring that video up now. We're about to see how, yes, with the, with the boat, how, this octo how our octopus here at the aquarium eats. So, watch this. So, here's our octopus. This is taken from behind the scenes in the top of the exhibit. So, that thing that looks like a mirror behind it, that's actually the window of the exhibit. The octopus can actually see through the window. It just looks like a mirror because the angle we're looking at it at. Now, there's a little boat here. Now, this boat, just a toy plastic boat, right? got some in it. You might be able to guess what it is. It looks a little bit like a rock or a clam. It's actually a crab. It's part of a crab. And this is the same kind of crab that you might eat if you ordered crab at a restaurant, by the way. Now, this crab, and don't worry, the crab is not alive, <laughs> is hanging out there in this little boat. And the octopus is like, huh, what's this boat? I've never seen this boat before. But being a curious creature, you know what? I'm going to reach on over and inspect it. And let's see here. And there it goes. By the way, this is how they did it in the old movies. They just got a little toy boat and had a normal octopus come up and grab it, and then they'd pretend it was a giant octopus. Have you ever seen one of those old movies with a giant octopus? So, here we go. The octopus is feeling the boat. Remember, it's smelling and tasting with those suction cups as it goes. It's probably like, oh, I taste some, something crabby on this boat. And there it goes. So, to answer your question, Gage, the octopus grabs onto the food with its 
arms, and we call them arms on an octopus. And then it wraps its body around it, basically. Now what it's doing, though, we can't see it, because octopuses never show you when they eat. They always hide it underneath their body. What it did is it took that crab right out of the boat. Now it's letting go of the boat, because it knows the boat's not food. And now it's got its beak. And with its beak, it's going to be biting right through the hard shell of that crab. And then, this is the really fun part, like most mollusks, or most mollusks, I guess you just, I should say, with mouths, the octopus has a weird kind of drill-like tongue called a radula. Sort of like a drill, sort of like a brush. And this tongue kind of acts like a scrambler. So when the octopus opens up its mouth, this tongue, this radula tongue, basically goes into that, that crab shell that's cracked open and starts to tear up the meat and this basically then the octopus then just sucks in pieces as it goes. Octopuses and a lot of other mollusks kind of puree their food as they eat it. So, you know, like when you put something in a blender. So, and then the octopus just finishes the job, leaves the shell probably behind, and that's what the octopus does. And that's very similar to what other cephalopods do also. If it's a thing like a cuttlefish or a, or a, or a squid, they also have a beak, they also have a radula. Aleka had a question, how big is the biggest and how small is the smallest octopus? Ooh, you got me here, I'm about to learn something. So the biggest octopus is actually our good friend right here, the giant Pacific octopus, which at the very largest they've ever been found, the biggest one ever found was about 16 feet long, and it was actually about over 30 feet when it stretched its arms out like this, kind of like doing like a sea star type thing. If they measured from end of one arm all the way to the other, it was like 30 feet long. And the smallest, ooh, I don't know what the smallest, I know some small octopuses. The, ooh. A woofy octopus. And how, how small is the woofy octopus? Less than an inch. No, well, it's not too small. The, uh, one of my favorite small octopuses is the blue ring octopus, which you might have heard of. Deadly venom, but a very tiny package. And let's see. What, what else we got? Oh, why does an octopus have so many tentacles? That's a good question. So, and here's a, we can learn some, we can learn some cephalopod terms here. So, in an octopus, we actually call them arms. Though, honestly, that's, doesn't matter that much. That's just what scientists decided. And, <laughs> the, and these arms are numbering how many for an octopus? Octo eight, right? Now, why do they have so many? This is a question I don't know if we can answer exactly. Because there's a little bit of a difference. There's some differences in the number of appendages that you see across different cephalopods. Octopuses have eight. Squid and cuttlefish have got eight arms, but then they also have two tentacles, which are kind of like kind of like arms that are skinnier and they only have suction cups on the very end that they use to shoot out and grab things. And then if you look at the, if you look at one of their ancient weird relatives, the chambered nautilus, which I think we actually have a picture of, this thing, I don't actually even know how many tentacles these things have got, but there's, well they're not, I don't even know what they really call them. So they, you see all these things? These are like the primitive ancient version of what eventually became arms and tentacles and, and cephalopods later. Chambered nautiluses are really ancient. They've been around, they're still alive today, but they've been around for about 250 million years, almost totally unchanged. And they don't even have suction cups. They have these grooves and they create suction by kind of folding them around stuff. And I don't even know how many are there. Are. It's more than eight. It's like 12 or 15. It number, it's a, yeah, it's a big number. So up to 90 on a nautilus, depending on the species. So. The ancient ancestors of the octopus and the squid and all that probably had a whole bunch of different varieties of, of numbers of tentacles. But for one reason or another, the octopus eventually landed on eight. Now, probably the reason why there's that specific number is because maybe that was just the number it had and then certain other things kind of depended on that number staying that way. You know, oftentimes the animals, as animals evolve, as animals change with time and adapt to, adapt to you know, the environment over millions of years, sometimes something that might have been just kind of a coin, co coin toss type choice to begin with, will become so embedded as part of the animal's body type that it kind of just sticks around even if another, even if maybe another arm would be useful. But maybe to make an octopus with nine arms, you just have to throw out a whole bunch of the... Anyway, I'm getting too deep into, the, into, the, into this here. So, to back up, that's a really good question. Why do they have eight arms? I don't know if anyone can exactly say why. But I can tell you why things would be problematic if they had fewer than eight arms, because an octopus's brain doesn't exist in just one spot in its body. An octopus has got a somewhat decentralized 
nervous system, which means that it's got one main brain, which is actually, or, is actually right in the middle here, kind of right around where its mouth is. And it's kind of almost, it has almost like a ring-like shape to it. Very weird looking brain. And each one of the arms also has its own little mini brain. And this is why if an octopus loses an arm, sometimes that arm will continue to, to crawl along and grab things for a while until it runs out of nutrients to keep, to keep moving. And octopuses can't regrow their arms. This is another question we got. Can octopuses regrow arms? They cannot. However, an octopus can make do if it loses an arm, but, uh, but it might be, well, I guess a little, it'll, it'll have lost whatever smarts that arm was giving it, so maybe it'll be a little less, little less intelligent. Now, those arms, though, again, also linked into the, central, the, cent the same nervous system in the middle, right? So all the main decisions are being made by that middle brain, but then the arms themselves are kind of partially controlled by a separate thing that only sends some information back to the other brain. And it's something that scientists have researched and study a lot because it's very interesting to figure out how does an animal with kind of its brain spread out across its body make decisions? It's, very, uh, it's a very tough question, right? Now, the other thing that I'm going to talk about in a moment is, which, I, but I think I have another couple questions coming in, so I'll answer these first. Ooh, Julian had a question too. How many different kinds of octopus are there? I didn't know this one, so I'm glad Carrie wrote it down for me. 300 or so. That's a lot of different kinds of octopuses. So, and remember, octopuses have been around for quite a long time, so they've had a chance to diversify in all sorts of different places. This is a two-spot octopus, one of the locals. Not to be confused with the blue ring octopus. Yes, it has a blue ring. But the two-spot octopus has got two of them. The blue ring octopus has got rings all over. Now, let's see. We've got a couple more questions. Christopher asked, can octopuses hurt humans? That's a good question. I'll answer it two ways. One, no in the sense that octopuses don't want to hurt humans. I mean, we, we've, we have animal encounters with our octopus at the aquarium on a regular basis. I've touched our octopus many, many times. It's curious about me, but it's never tried to hurt me or anything like that. And octopuses, there's never any case for some octopus out of the nowhere just like, yeah, I'm going to attack that human. Now, that being said, is it possible for an octopus to hurt a human? Well, yeah, but it's possible for most animals to do that if, if, they, really, if they really wanted to. Even, the, even my pet parakeet can, can bite me on the finger if it wants to, right? So, or if I do something to make it angry or anything like that. So octopuses, yeah, they can defend themselves. And yeah, some, there are actually quite a few venomous octopuses. Luckily, most of them are just, just hurts. It's not deadly. But... That means you shouldn't go messing around with some random octopus that you find. You should leave them to their own business, but don't worry about what they're going to do to you because they are totally harmless, and I guarantee you can move faster. Now, let's see. What else do we got? How does the octopus know what pattern or color to change to blend in? And this is from Aleka, and also how can they blend in with, or can they blend in with other animals? I'm really glad that you brought this up, Aleka, because we are going to explore that subject right now with the time we have left. So, and I see we have a couple of shark and octopus, uh, sharks and octopus questions, which we'll get to in a minute. So, here's the crazy thing about octopuses. Octopuses, right, we know they can change color really, really well to blend in with environment, their environment. And to answer your question, yes, they can sometimes, in some species, can blend in with other animals or at least impersonate other animals. There's an octopus called the mimic octopus that's famous for doing certain things to try to look like a lionfish and a crab and stuff like that. But the thing is, in order to camouflage, right, you would think that an animal would need to be able to see what color its environment is. And usually animals can see color by having different kinds of cells in their eyes to detect different kinds of light, different wavelengths, different colors of light. And that allows us to be able to tell, you know, the color of something in addition to just how bright it is. So we have two different kinds of cells in our eyes for that, rods and cones. You might have heard about them in school. Now, when you look inside an octopus's eye, and you look for those color sensing cells, scientists only find one kind, which normally when an animal only has one kind, it means that that animal sees in black and white and cannot see color. And this was a mystery then for a long time. In fact, it was a mystery until just a few years ago. Whenever somebody asked this question, how does an octopus see, know to change color to match things if it doesn't know what color anything is because it's, co it's colorblind? that we would just go like, we don't know. Nobody knows how an octopus can see color. Because obviously they can, otherwise how do they blend in? But I don't know. But it turns out, based on some research that was done just a few years ago, that we're pretty certain that what they're doing actually has to do with how weird the shape of their pupil is. 
This one's a line. If we go look at the cuttlefish, which sees in the same way, you can see an even weirder example. You know how you look at most animals' eyes, you see a circle in the middle that lets the light in? It's called a pupil. Ours is a circle. If you look at a cat, it'll be a, kind of a more of a slit, unless you're looking at a tiger, in which case it's a circle. But it's usually a pretty regular shape, right? And the reason for that is that the light has to come in like, like it would through a camera lens or anything else. It has to come in kind of at a good angle where it can be focused onto the part of your eye that senses light. And that way you get a nice crisp image. But octopuses and cuttlefish have got this weird pupil. And this guy here, it looks like a U or even a little bit like a W. Sometimes in cuttlefish, it'll form into almost like a Q-like shape. Other times in octopuses, you'll see it like this. You'll see it kind of just get sort of wrinkled. And it turns out that, octopus, that octopuses can see color basically by messing around with the shape of their pupil. As their pupil changes color, it changes, or changes shape, it changes the way certain colors of light focus. So if something becomes, I know this is complicated, and a lot of you are probably having a hard time following it. I'm having a hard time following it myself. But basically, if an, if, as an octopus refocuses or reshapes its pupil, it changes the way certain colors focus in its eye. And so it can go, okay, when my pupil's a W, that thing's out of focus, which must mean that it's red. Weird, right? Yeah, it's really weird. But apparently this works really, really, really well because octopuses can blend in incredibly well with the environment around them. And like we said, even sometimes with other creatures. And actually, I guess technically if you're blending in with coral, you are blending in with other creatures like this octopus is doing. And let's look at this one again. Again, this is a great one. It's like, no octopus here, just some, oh, wait a sec. Oh, whoa, way uh, ooh. I see. So that octopus is sitting there, right, waiting for something to eat. And then along comes some scuba diver, and it's like, oh, I can't eat that thing. I better get out of here. So it bails because it knows its, it's cover's been blown, so to speak, right? The octopus is like, oh, they saw me. Got to go. And, but normally, the octopus might pounce. Octopuses have been known to eat all kinds of things. Octopuses have been seen eating small sharks or any shark that they can overpower. Um, and just because they're so smart, they can overpower and outsmart a lot of things. Now, speaking of which, we have a couple shark questions, or a couple shark-related questions. Um, are sharks really good at tasting? They sure are. Sharks do have a sense of taste, and they can tell the difference between things that they like and things they don't like, though they are known to occasionally eat things that don't make any sense. But that's not really surprising, considering that you know, we've dumped a lot of stuff in the ocean that is totally unfamiliar to them. This is one of the reasons why the octopus is amazing. You know, most animals, when they encounter something new, like litter and trash in their environment, oftentimes they might mistake it for food, they'll eat it, and it gets stuck in their stomach, and it's very bad for them. But the octopus is one of the few animals that seems to be smart enough not to have that problem. Now, here's a great picture of our sand tiger shark up close. I think there's one more question on there. Yeah. Um, oh, which shark has the sharpest teeth? You know what? I don't know. I don't know. This is pretty darn sharp here. This is our sand tiger shark. His teeth are very pointy. It's like a mouthful of needles. And this is used basically to grab on and, and swallow stuff real fast. But it depends on your definition of sharp. If you mean like a sharp point, the sand tiger shark is certainly a candidate. If you mean a sharp edge, the great white shark, the tiger shark, the bull shark are all, have, all have really sharp teeth. But it's also a question of how powerful the bite is and stuff too. So it's not, the sharpness of the teeth is important, but there's a point at which being more sharp, you know, is only going to do you so much good. And there's other ways to make your bite really effective, like the shape of the teeth and stuff like that. And I know I said I was going to give some bonus shark questions at the end, and it looks like I'm getting them. So here's one. Are megalodons real? Megalodons were real. I wish they still were. Though if you want to learn more about them, there's a great episode of The Daily Bubble starring Seymour Shark that's all about the megalodon, which you can check out if you haven't seen The Daily Bubble yet. Find it on Facebook or YouTube. And uh, this is a great white shark. We, are, we, we don't know a lot about ancient sharks aside from their teeth and what we can figure out based on looking at their teeth. Megalodon teeth look a lot like great white shark teeth, so we basically figured that the megalodon was probably a really, really giant great white shark. They've also, or really, really giant looking, really, really giant shark that looked like a great white shark, more or less. We also know that they were big, they were really big because they, we found their bones embedded in, or, sorry, we found their teeth embedded in the fossilized bones of whales. So we're pretty confident that megalodons like to eat whales from time to time. But what we think happened to the megalodon was that once, the, once, once whales like the orca came along, or the killer whale, they started to do the same exact stuff that the megalodon did, and they were also a lot smarter. So we think basically the megalodon probably got outcompeted in, in, in the ocean for prey, 
and you know there can only be so many top predators kind of going after the same food sources. Um, but the megalodon was real, and we have lots and lots of fossilized teeth from megalodons. Now, final question, since it is 1.30, have any octopus, octopuses escaped at your aquarium? Okay, I'll tell you a story from way back when I was first starting here, which, uh, which is a good example of why we don't do certain things anymore. First off, no octopuses have ever escaped from this aquarium. In fact, I don't know of any octopuses who have permanently escaped from anywhere. Octopuses are famous escape artists, though, so you have to be really careful to make sure their exhibits don't have anything that they can climb onto. Oftentimes, we put, we put like foamy or, or surfaces or things like AstroTurf around the edges of an octopus exhibit because their suction cups don't work on it. And that way, you can prevent them from climbing out or you just put a lid on it. But once, back in the day, we used to have a little two-spot octopus that we walked around the Great Hall to show to people. And it was a fun time. Um, but we stopped doing it eventually because we felt that, you know, it probably wasn't the right thing to do to an octopus because we, were just, we would wheel it around in this cart and it was very interesting to watch. But... Maybe the octopus didn't like it so much, so we don't do this anymore. Um, but, but I've been here for a long time, so I was still here when we were doing that. And one of the first things I ever did when I became an educator here is they said, all right, Luke, it's your turn to go walk the octopus around the Great Hall. And I said, okay. So in order to do this, I had to take the octopus from the bigger aquarium it lived in and put it in a smaller aquarium that fit on a cart that I could wheel around to show people. Now, I was able to get the octopus out of the big aquarium and into the small aquarium without any problems. And I took it around, showed it to people in the Great Hall for 10, 15 minutes, and then I brought it back to put it back in its house, in its bigger aquarium. But the octopus decided at that point it didn't want to go back into the bigger aquarium. So as I tried to grab on, as I tried to basically push it into this smaller little sort of thing we used to move it, it was basically a bowl, I tried to gently guide this octopus into the bowl, the octopus decided to try to go around the other side and climb over the edge of its small aquarium and then it was on the cart and slithering across the cart and then I'm like okay I gotta stop this octopus so I'm trying to grab the octopus but the octopus I've got two arms the octopus has got eight so I'm holding on to this octopus trying to gently like pull the arms free and the great thing about octopuses is they're so stretchy that they're 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 pretty durable creatures they're, they're, they're an octopus is a very is a very easy animal to handle because they'll just they can get out of almost anything so so I'm grabbing this octopus, right, and trying to like, be like, okay, come on, buddy, let's, let's go here. And then it starts climbing up my arm like this. And it took me, and then finally I'm just like, okay, arms, arms, arm off, arm off, arm off. And he's in the, and he's in the aquarium. Okay, whew, I got him. So I was present, I guess you could say, this is about 14 years ago, I was present for an attempted octopus escape one time, during which the octopus did briefly uh, get out of my control. And this is why you don't let inexperienced educators wheel octopuses around. And I'd like to say that as a message for my, for my management at the time. Now, um, and like I said, we don't do that anymore because we no longer think that that's really a good thing to do. And I think my story kind of tells you why, right? But the octopus was fine. Had a wonderful, had a wonderful nice, happy life. And, um, and yeah, that's the story of an octopus escape. Now, we are out of time, but don't worry. We'll be back in 25 minutes with seal and sea lions and their conservation. And if you have any email questions you want to send us that we haven't answered yet on the show, by all means, you can email them to us at live at lbaop.org. We monitor that off and on throughout the day and respond pretty quickly. And you can join us again in, what, 26 minutes for our next episode, which will be our last of the day. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Have a fun and safe weekend if you don't come and see us again, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.